Good morning, Grace Point, and happy Easter to each of you. Thank you for joining with us this morning, those of you who have joined us in person, and thank you for joining us, those of you who are joining us online. What a wonderful day of celebration this is, and it's so good to be together. I trust the Lord will bless you and encourage you through our time together. Around the world today, countless millions of people are celebrating Easter, celebrating Easter Sunday. And depending upon where they are, the nature of their celebration will vary. You see, over the past 2,000 years, uh, since that very first Easter Sunday, different cultures have adopted different traditions as part of their Easter Sunday celebrations. Let me give you a couple of examples. For instance, uh, in the residents of Oh, France, uh, actually, they have something they do every Easter Sunday, and that is that they gather together in the town square and they make a gigantic omelet. Isn't that a very French thing to do? I'm talking about an omelet that is massive. It uh, requires some 15,000 eggs and uh, they are placed into a gigantic pan that serves omelet for over a thousand people. Each family breaks the eggs in their home in the morning, and then they gather in the main square, and they cook the omelet, and they enjoy lunch together, and then they enjoy dinner together, and then they enjoy breakfast the next day together. Anyway, you know, you get the idea. It goes on and on because of the size of this omelet. In Bermuda, the sky's the limit when it comes to Easter traditions, for on that small island nation, people who want to celebrate show off and fly their brightly colored kites. Kite flying is paired, of course, with some good food, particularly the feasts of codfish and hot cross buns. Meanwhile, Brazil has a much more aggressive tradition when it comes to Easter. Their locals construct straw renditions of Jesus' betrayer Judas, and then they proceed to beat them up and then to burn them. Uh, so Brazil's not fooling around when it comes to Easter celebrations, a bit more violent. Not quite the same in Poland. In Poland, uh, there is a custom that has developed uh, that's quite peculiar, and it centers around water fights, actually having a giant water fight. Apparently, it all began innocently enough when uh, quite a few years ago, young men sprinkled young women with a bit of perfumed water, and now it has gotten completely out of hand, and it is all-out street water fights. Uh, as a celebration of Easter. Meanwhile, here in Canada and in many other places around the world, one of the long-standing Easter traditions is that of the Easter Bunny. The Easter Bunny, who allegedly hides colored eggs and chocolate candy around the home of children uh, the day before the night before Easter Sunday. And then on Easter Sunday morning, the children get their Easter baskets and they go searching around the house trying to find as many of these treats that the Easter bunny has left. Some of you may have actually gone through that this morning or will be doing that as part of your celebrations sometime later today. It's kind of the Easter version of Santa Claus. At the Webster House, uh, when our daughters were growing up, we had a number of rabbits. And I can tell you based on personal experience over quite a number of years that I have never seen a Easter bunny, a rabbit, actually, um, you know, produce a chocolate-covered egg or a colored egg. I've seen them produce a lot of other stuff, but none of them of that sort of nature. Throughout the world, various traditions have developed around this day, Easter Sunday, many of them focused around food and, and fun. But ultimately, Easter Sunday is not really about giant omelets or water fights or even cute bunnies. Easter is about something far, far more significant than any of those things. It's really about a most momentous event because it is about the very real resurrection of a very real dead man named Jesus. 
The Bible tells the story this way in the Gospel of Matthew. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb to look at the tomb, rather. Now, Jewish law required burial on uh, really the same day that you died, unless you died late in the day and then you would, be di- you would be buried the very next day. However, burials were forbidden on the Sabbath, that is, on Saturday. And since Jesus died on Friday, that meant that his body had to be quickly buried before sunset when the Sabbath began. Usual preparation for a burial within a Jewish context was washing of the body and then the external application of spices that was designed to kind of hide the smell of decomposition. But because Jesus was buried so quickly to meet the sundown deadline, those preparations had not been completed. Such weighed heavily on the minds of a number of the women who had been faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that they who had watched him be so brutally crucified on Friday. And so early on Sunday morning, after the Saturday Sabbath, had ended, they made their way to the tomb where Jesus' body had been laid. The parallel passage over in the Gospel of Mark tells us that they brought spices with them to anoint his body. It also tells us that as they made their way to the tomb, they were quite concerned about a certain reality, and that is that they had seen that as Jesus had been laid in the tomb, a large stone had been rolled across the center of the entrance to the tomb to seal the tomb. And they, of course, were wondering how in the world were they going to gain access to the tomb. As it happened, they didn't need to worry about that. Because we read in our text, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Now, one of the things that I absolutely love about this account of the resurrection of our Lord is the understated way in which Jesus meets these women. Think about it. These women who loved Jesus so dearly, they had been some of his most faithful followers. And as such, they were totally devastated by his death, and they were greatly confused by his crucifixion. They decide to head to the tomb around sunrise on Sunday morning. And when they get there, to their surprise, the stone has been rolled away. There's an angel who tells them the tomb is empty because Jesus has risen from the dead. Afraid, yet filled with joy, two emotions that one rarely experiences at the same time, these women run to tell Jesus' disciples the surprising and somewhat incredible, seemingly impossible news that Jesus has been raised. Suddenly, they come face to face with Jesus himself, the very same Jesus they had watched so brutally killed on Friday. And at that incredible moment, Jesus simply says to them, greetings. Now, for you to appreciate that moment, that would be the equivalent of today, Jesus saying, hi, how you doing? What's going on? The word greetings was the most common sort of uh, way that one would interact with another individual when you met them. It was very common. It was very casual. And this is the way that Jesus uh, speaks to these women as they encounter him. I I love that reality, that understated way that Jesus speaks to them. And really, 
it's in a sense Jesus saying, what did you expect? Didn't I tell you that I would come back? But it's the next thing that Jesus says to the women on this occasion that I want us to particularly focus on during our time of study this morning. Very significant. In the parallel account over in the Gospel of John, Jesus says to these women these words, Go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, at first, when you look at those words, you may not understand or appreciate the significance of what Jesus is saying. So, let me try to unpack it for you. Up until now, Jesus has referred to his 12 key disciples as being just that, disciples. Or sometimes he referred to them as his friends or his servants. And yet here, for the very first time, he calls these guys, notice, my brothers. My brothers. The last time he saw them, they had deserted him at his arrest. Or in the case of Peter, after Peter had denied knowing him three times in the moment of his greatest need. You can imagine how the disciples must have felt about themselves. Words like failure, loser, coward certainly would be fitting. But despite all of that, despite their cowardice, despite their unfaithfulness, here Jesus refers to them as my brother my brothers. You see, something incredibly momentous has happened because of Jesus' death that first Good Friday and His resurrection that first Easter Sunday. Something not based upon the goodness of their performance, because frankly their performance had really, really been bad. But something had happened, something significant, what happened because of the death and resurrection of Jesus is not some well-deserved reward, but rather an undeserved gift of grace. Up until now, Jesus has called God His Father, but now the resurrected Jesus says, notice in the text, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus had never said that before. This is highly significant. In other words, it's now possible because of the momentous events of that first Good Friday and that first Easter Sunday for you and me to know God in a personal way, to know God as Jesus knows God, as my Father, as my God. When I was uh, many, many years, many, many years ago, when I was in high school, uh, I, I did pretty well in certain subjects, English and history and things like that, um, but math was not one of the subjects I did very well in. I mean, I, I was pulling, you know, mid-70s, high 70s, sometimes I'd trip into the 80s, but it wasn't really my favorite course, and I always kind of struggled with it. Uh, and I really, really wanted to do better, but uh, I just seemingly, you know, couldn't pull it off. Um, and what made it worse was my best friend at the time in high school was just a math genius. And so he would look at me and just say, what's wrong with you, Webster? Uh, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I was trying hard, but I just couldn't at times figure it out. And, uh, and so I really wanted to do better, and I remember when it came to grade 12, I decided as we began that school year that I was going to become a new person as it relates to mass, uh, math. I was going to take on a new profile, uh, a new identity as it were. And so from day one, when we would go to math class, I would write these initials on the blackboard, TNSW. And I did this every single time we had math. I would go into the class and I would write on the board somewhere, TNSW. And eventually, the teacher said, who is writing these initials on the board and what do they mean? And by then, a lot of my friends knew I was doing it and they would say, well, Webster's doing it. 
We have no idea what it means. And so he asked me to tell everybody what it meant. And I said, it means the new Steve Webster. It was my attempt to approach that challenge in a new way, in a fresh way, and, and in a sense, take on a new identity as it relates to math. And so I would write TNSW, the new Steve Webster. Well, when the first uh, report cards came out, it, things hadn't worked quite as well as I had hoped. And I was still struggling. I was still not where I wanted to be. I wasn't really making much improvement. And so my friend, I said, okay, look, you've got to help me here. I'm really, you know, i got to up my game here. And uh, so I spent some time with him trying to. And then when I went to class, I wrote um, TBNSW, which was the brand new Steve Webster. And as you can imagine, as you can kind of think as how this story goes, I was adding uh, letters to that uh, sort of little, uh, that little statement throughout the year because I continued to struggle with math and really never really got a handle on the person, being the person that I wanted to be. Well, because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we can now receive a new identity in relation to God and experience a new intimacy with God. This is now possible for you and me. Because of what Christ did through His crucifixion and His resurrection, it is possible for you to experience a brand new identity in your relationship with God. It is possible for you to experience something perhaps you have never experienced before. The Apostle Paul speaks of this transformative reality when he says in his letter to the Galatian church, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, there is my pre-Good Friday, Easter Sunday life, and now there is my post-Good Friday, Easter Sunday life. There's the old me, and now there's the new me. The old me they referred to as the old self. And the Bible teaches that this is the natural default condition of us as human beings. The old self is our selfish, sinful self. It messes up our lives. It, it is uh, that which ensnares us with guilt and ultimately it separates us from a holy God. But there is apparently a way to break free from that old me. And you'll notice in our text that the early followers of the resurrected Christ claimed that their old self had been crucified with Christ and that now they were experiencing new life, the very new resurrected life of Christ himself. There was the old self, prior to Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and then there's the new self that's available to us post-Good Friday, Easter Sunday. The old me that is sinful and dark, held hostage by habits that we are ashamed of but ultimately can't control, that old self can be dealt a death blow through the cross of Christ. And likewise, the core significance for you and me of the resurrection of Christ that first Easter Sunday is that He was raised to life so that each of us can also be raised to a new experience of life in Him. That is, He was resurrected so that you and I can be resurrected with Him. That new me is the life of Christ living within, guiding me, comforting me, empowering me, forgiving me. Following the resurrection of Christ that first Easter Sunday, the early followers of Jesus would say incredible things like this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, listen to the language here, 
When we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. Again, they claim that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ. In other words, I'm not what I once was because through the death and resurrection of Christ, I have been made new. As incredible as it seems, because I have embraced Christ as my Savior, because I have humbled myself at the foot of the cross, because solely of His grace and His mercy in my life, I am not who I once was. I am now in Christ. I am now so, so connected to Christ that His death on the cross was my death. His resurrection on the cross is my life. It's all of Him, none of me. It's all a gift. It's all of undeserved grace. Jesus now calls me His brother. And now His Father is my Father and He is my God. Good Friday and Easter makes all of that possible. That amazing transformation is available to each and every one of us through the work of Christ that first Good Friday and that first Easter Sunday. You know, for all of us, there are momentous events that shape our lives. If you think of your life, you can probably think of a number of events that really have shaped who you are, things that have been formative, things that have really impacted your life. I can think of a number of them. For instance, uh, when I think of experiences that have marked my life significantly, I think, first of all, the family that I was born into. Family has a huge impact on you, right? I think of my uh, father. I think of my mother. I think of my two brothers, that has shaped the family I was born into, has shaped, for good and bad, who I am. I also think of meeting at the age of 17 a girl the same age, a girl named Debbie Walker. And I think of getting married to that girl five years later, now some 37 years ago, next month. That's a transformative experience in my life that has shaped who I am. I also think of deciding to forego my desire to become a lawyer when I was in university and instead sensing God's call to go to seminary and to become a pastor. Was my young wife ever shocked about that decision? Thinking she was going to be marrying a lawyer and then all of a sudden you're going to become a what? A pastor. That was a transformative decision. I think of having our first daughter. I think of having our second daughter. I think of having our third daughter. Do you see a pattern? I think of having our fourth daughter. Um, four daughters, no sons. Uh, I, I, all of the, you know, those are trans, those are, are, are moments that mark who you are, who you become as a human being, a father of four daughters. I think of becoming the pastor of this church. You uh, may find this hard to believe, but 29 years ago, almost to this very day, becoming the pastor of this church, that has marked my life. That has formed who I am. These are moments that uh, have really impacted the person that I am. And as you look back over your life, there are moments like that. There are experiences like that that you would point to as well. But the single most momentous event that can ever take place in a person's life is inseparably linked to the most momentous event in all of human history. And that is that first 
Good Friday, that first Easter Sunday. You see, because of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, it is now possible for you to know God personally. I'm not talking about knowing about God. There's a lot of people who know about God. I'm talking about knowing God personally, where you commune with God, where you speak with God, where you know God's leading in your life, where God gives you wisdom, gives you enabling power beyond anything that you possibly have in in and of yourself, where God is your comfort when there seems to be no other comfort available to you, where God is your strength, where you know the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in your life, when you get up every day that you know that you are loved of God and that you are one of God's children and you will always be and that nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is the most remarkable experience that anyone can ever undergo and anyone can ever experience personally and that is to know God intimately, personally, To move from simply knowing about Him to knowing Him as your Father, as your God, and to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, your Lord, and your brother. It is remarkable. It is the most transformative experience that one can ever experience. It is now possible for you to move from being alienated from God to being reconciled to God. It is now possible for you to experience the forgiveness of your sins and freedom from that guilt that you have been dragging with you through your life. It is now possible for you to become a spiritual brother or sister to Christ, friends, while there are many events in your life that have helped make you who you are. The death and the resurrection of Jesus can remake you into who God wants you to be. And that is what this weekend is all about. That's what Good Friday is about. That's what Easter Sunday is about. What God in His love and grace has done so that you might know Him, that you might be restored to an eternal relationship with Him, that you might know all of the blessings that He has for you. And it all comes through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to gather on this very special day, Easter Sunday, and to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we do so, that our hearts are just just overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude. Our hearts are are resounding with this sense of thankfulness. And we worship you and we praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your victory over death, for your resurrection from that grave. And all that it means to us, the hope that it it provides us with, the new life that it offers to us, the relationship with God, our Creator, that it makes available to us and so much more. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would, in these moments, you would work to speak into the hearts of those who are here with us in person and watching online this morning. I think particularly of of any who have yet to come to know you as Savior and as Lord. I pray that you will minister your grace to them. I pray that you will draw them Draw them by your love and mercy into a recognition and a surrender of their lives to who you are. I pray, Lord, that you will work in this way even in these moments. 
And for those who are, who are listening to these words, I pray that if they sense the Spirit of God leading them, I ask that they would open their life to you in faith, Lord Jesus, today. I pray that they will simply, simply ask you to forgive them of their sins. Ask you to be their Savior. Ask you to lead them in a life that will honor and glorify you and that they would put their trust in you and you alone, Jesus Christ, for all of that and more. I pray, Lord, that your name will be exalted in the lives of those who are going to come into the kingdom of God today through your work of grace and mercy. And it all goes back to what you did on that most momentous weekend, that first Good Friday, that first Easter Sunday. And that is why we're here today, to worship you, to praise you, to adore you, to magnify your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. If uh, you are here today or you're watching online and you want to know more about what Christ has done for you, you want to know more about what Easter really means for you and how it can transform your life, then I have a, a booklet that I want to get into your hands. If you're here today and you're in that sort of position in your life right now, at the end of the service, I'm going to have some of these just up here on the stage. And As you make your way out, you can come up here and pick up a copy. Uh, this is not for those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, leave these, if you would, please, for those who perhaps are searching and seeking. That's available to you. Now, if you're watching online, and for those of you here, the same uh, booklet is available online in a digital form. If you go to our website, gracepointtoronto.ca, right on our homepage, you'll find a link to the booklet right down at the bottom of the homepage. And also, you may be interested, there's also a link there on a fascinating video journey that's connected to this booklet, uh, kind of a travelogue uh, approach to a presentation of the, the work of Christ and the reality of what Christ can mean to your life and my life today, that's also available on our website at gracepointtoronto.ca, and I trust these resources will be a blessing to you.